You're listening to the Lore Maker Chronicles, currently presenting a verse and actual play by Roll for Perception. Content warning This episode contains discussion and role play related to domestic abuse, suicide, ghostly entities, and general horror related content. Please take care of yourself if these items affect you. This is episode one of the Dance of Dreams. Prepare yourself for the fear that will flow into your soul. And welcome to the Loremaker Chronicles. My name is Terry Jakimak, one of two founders of Roll for Perception, and we're very excited to start our journey of the Loremaker Chronicles for those that are interested in a variety of TTRPGs. This is going to be one of several systems that we share with our audiences, Vason being something that I've been wanting to play for quite some time, but we have a whole host of them lined up. I just wanted to mention that if you want to keep updated with information on the podcast, make sure you go to www.rollforperception.com. Additionally, we will be doing a giveaway at the end of the Vason actual play. We'll be giving away the Vason text, the core rule book. So if you're interested in that, you're going to need to check out for that information on the website, which should be going up about a week after this podcast. Finally, thank you again for all those that have supported us through the years, and we're super excited to begin a new journey. So here we go with the Dance of Dreams. You are members of the society. At one point in time, it had a longer name, a different name, but in the end, the society fell apart. You have begun to rebuild the society. You are Thursday's children. You have the sight of Vason. You have already contacted Linia Glint. She is one of the last remaining survivors of the society from the catastrophe that occurred 10 years ago. She's told you the history about the society and given you the keys to its headquarters in Uppsala, Castle Gillenkrutz. You've made your home there. You know that those with sight are looked down on. Linnea herself lives within the asylum, but it is up to you to rebuild the society and to answer the call of mysteries. It is early morning, and you hear a knocking at the door. I'll answer. Standing in front of you, dressed in what you can tell to be, is a mail carrier. He hands you a letter, bows, and exits. You open it. The Dance of Dreams, a shadow play of horror, murder, and revenge. Let yourself be enraptured and terrified by shadow theater with clockwork as amazing as that of the master's constructions on the continent. Watch as evil smiles. Good people go to their doom and spirits come to life. Follow Oscar Yort's encounter with the Black One, his struggle, and finally his betrayal, which claimed his life. Hear the tunes of the enchanted flute that sends souls dancing to hell. The show will premiere shortly at the Witch Cat Inn, not for the faint of heart. On the note, someone has written, Meet me tonight at the Witch Cat Inn. Olas. As you study the invitation, you notice that the seal, which was on it and you broke, was in red wax and says, Clint. Klaus will turn to uh, Helena, is it? Uh, And, uh, hand her the note and go now i don't know what's evil around here but i'm gonna say there's something wrong going on with this place Um, that sounds all fine all kinds of fucked up 
I'll look up from my teacup that I have uh, just sort of resting in my hand. Um, I raised an eyebrow and sort of listened into what was happening at the door, but not giving it away as I sipped my tea at the table. What do you mean? What is going on around here? Now, I mean, it's some sort of shadow play. Now, I heard of plays, but here, back in the States, we didn't have no such thing as a shadow play. You have never heard of the, um, the, uh, with the puppets. They are paper craft, uh, um, in between the light. They create the shadows. No, I heard that not at all. <clears throat> but, uh... You must not do that much, then. All I need are between the pews and God himself. But, uh... Well, I have heard of various uses of, um... theater in... Uh, churches and things. Not a mind we didn't. It's unusual. Well... There, there's different ways of telling the stories of this world. Um, I prefer the written word myself, but I know that lots of people find different ways to tell them. Standing by, standing by the fireplace, the doctor is looking down into it and turns. Puppet theater. Churches. Equal fodder for weak minds. What is this foolishness? Looks to be an invitation of some kind from a uh, Mr. Clint Olas, maybe. If I'm reading the way these uh, words mean over here, the names rather. Usually we put the first and the last back in the states, but people do weird things over here. Haven't quite got oh, used yes. to it yet. Back in the states, eh? <sighs> I wonder how they got this address. Well, I don't think we're exactly unknown. Find where the strange people live. Tova's going to come up to Helena. Miss Helena, another cup? You know, oh. at least it's not the debt collector. Yes, um, it is nice to have it, um, not be someone looking for a coin, um, for once. Uh, yes, uh, um, and I'll, uh, take my, my teacup and hold it up toward, uh, Tova. Thank you. Um, and her hands sort of shake as she brings it back down to the table. Another cup for you, doctor. The doctor turns to Tova and his stern features, he's tall, looks looks a bit pasty, um, as though in the firelight, the, the firelight actually gives his his uh, pale skin a bit of a glow. Uh, his his facial, facial features soften beneath the thick mustache that he has. And he, he says, yes, Tova, thank you, uh, very much. And he offers the cup that he had in his hands and, quite frankly, had forgotten about. Uh, Tova takes the cup with her old withered hands and starts pouring the tea that starts to kind of jingle and clatter and hand it back. <sighs> for you, doctor, anything. Any for you, priest. I was feeling awfully left out, but yeah, I would like a cup. <laughs> It would seem there's none left in the pot. I'll go back and make some more. Uh, well, I don't suppose that'll be necessary anyhow. We got a play to get to and uh, invitations to meet and all that fun stuff. Yeah, sugar cube over there, though. I'll suck on one of those on the way. Of That's course. about the way you Americans take your tea, isn't it, anyway? Just basically pure sugar? Well, we like it sweet, too. That's good. Yes. And she sort of just contemplates what he says there for a minute. Uh, as she she pulls one of the mini pencils from her hair, 
She has some sort of uh, her hair loosely pulled up. It's a bit of a mess, but several writing implements sort of sticking out of what uh, she would consider an updo. Um, and she pulls one of the pencils out and jots uh, something down that has uh, sparked an idea for her. And then she tucks the piece of paper away and returns the pencil to its former uh, home. As you all uh, finish up uh, the conversations here, uh, we move into what is a cool part of Vaison, which is in every mystery, you uh, are able to do some research prior to attending the mystery itself, just like uh, you would if you were investigating any sorts of non-strange message coming to you. And so you all live within a castle. Uh, You have a library within your castle, but there's also the university as well. Uh, And you would be able to gain information at either of those. So um, we will begin with Helena. Will you be uh, doing your research in the university or here in the library itself? Um... I would I would do it in the library here. Okay. Now, the library within the castle is decently sized. Uh, much of the society texts were destroyed, but you all have begun to bring your own editions in. Uh, I'm going to need you to do a learning test for me. Now, for those of you that are new to Vason and listening at home, most, uh, actually all of the skill tests are done with D6s, and it will depend specifically on the number of dice and how the successes work out. So, Helena, uh, can you tell us how much dice you'll be rolling for a uh, learning test? Uh, you'll have to remind me I have a plus two. But I don't remember what the base number is. Is it three? No, your base number is your logic because it falls under the logic. So then it would be four plus the two then. Correct. Correct. So you'll be rolling six on a learning check. All right. So I am putting all my dice. (laughs) And I'm rolling. All right. So I have one, six. Out of all six dice that I rolled. That is a success, um, which is good. Uh, As you uh, are doing research in there, you do find a book, a tome on the geography of the local region. And in it, it mentions note uh, of the witch cat is an inn at a crossroads north of Sigtuna. Uh, Sigtuna is south of where you're at. When the society was rebuilt after the great Ulu fire at the end of the 18th century, the inn was used as a gathering place, as the innkeeper at the time, Pairi Harjula, and I will share that spelling with my players, so uh, just so you know, pink right there, Uh, Pairi Harjula was a Thursday's child. He was the innkeeper there. Today, though, the inn is run by Pairi's grandson, Sammy Harjula. And I will give my players that information as well. So Helena went off to the library uh, to do her research. Um, Doctor, what is your preferred method of doing some research on the current situation? You do have the note uh, that does give you uh, some uh, clues within it. Uh, but would you prefer to go to the university, uh, talk to people on the street, hit the library? What is your preferred method? He would. Uh, I hit the library. Uh, not hit not the library. The uh, university. All right. Fantastic. Uh, being being back among educated folk would be good for his. Uh, basically, good for his constitution. Good for uh, his general state. 
All right. So you do, you head to, uh, to the university, and the university is uh, quite busy on this day. A variety of students, of faculty, uh, and administrators roam the grounds. You make your way to the university uh, library itself, uh, along with the uh, university librarians who are ever so helpful. Uh, you walk up to one of those, and the uh, librarian behind the desk looks at you. Mm. How may I help you? Mm -hmm. I... Looking for information uh, regarding regarding the Witch Cat Inn, uh, the history of the... And he goes on to discuss the, the area that it's in. He's more the general history, old clipping, uh, old newspaper clippings, anything that you may have. Uh, he looks, um, I will see what we may have available, but here, let me direct you, uh, sir, to a private study, and I will collect a variety of texts for you. And Much so he, obliged. He guides you over to a study room, uh, which you, uh, you see as a table and chair. You're able to sit down and uh, get some work done. He does bring you several uh, texts, and I need you to go ahead and give me a learning test. Okay, that is seven die. Wow, impressive. Logic uh, being my primary stat, so we'll start with the six. All right, and the seventh. That is one success out of seven. Oh my gosh, you guys are killing it. So as you are looking through the books, um, you're, you're not finding a, a ton of information regarding the witch cat in, but you, you did come across uh, in one of them, it, uh, there was some information uh, that piqued your interest. Uh, talked about shadow theater originating in India and China, and you realized that ah, this could be useful. Uh, it was practiced several centuries before Christ. Cut out paper figures are held up to a source of light, which creates shadows on cloth screen. A skilled puppeteer can manipulate the puppets and the light so that the figures appear to be alive. The art form came to Italy in the 18th century and continued to spread across Europe. Artists in England and France have experimented with clockworks to create automated shadow theaters. I'm going to paste that note for you in here. Unfortunately, it's in terrible formatting because it's coming from a PDF. Continuing on, Klaus, how do you go about your preparation and research for this? Well, I'm not much for uh, books except for the, the true word, but... Um I hit the streets and I, I talk to folks, uh, uh, talk about, uh, the witch cat, the owners, if anything strange happened nearby, any, any rumors, anything like that, anything that might, uh, have the devil living in such a, a place. Uh, go ahead and give me your learning test. Ah, perfect. I'm so good at learning. That gives me three dice, because I don't have anything. I failed all of them, Terry. Ah, I see, I see. All right. Well, you talk to a variety of people, and there are not a lot of people who wish to speak with someone of such a strange accent. Uh, you do hear, uh, somebody did mention that a private detective in town named Olas Clint uh, was looking for information, too. He has a small house in the middle of the city. Uh, he's made a name for himself as an expert in cases involving the occult. And uh, as I did before, I will share you that with terrible formatting. Uh, you also, as you're talking with people... Uh, you catch out of the corner of your eye as you've gathered the information regarding Olas Clint. You see what looks like a woman, but looks like a shadow, appeared for a moment, pointed at you, and then disappeared. 
I hold up my rosary and my Bible, and I go, stay back, demon. Stay back. And I just kind of step away from whatever that shadow demon was. And Tova, the final in doing your preparation and research, what do you do? Well, it's much too fancy to go to the university, leave that to the good doctor, stay here at the house, and refill the sugar jar that the priest has relinquished of its sugar. Maybe peruse one book, but leave that to Helena. Much clever that misses. And at least check to see if my revolver is loaded. Go ahead, give me a... Uh, do, you said you checked one book? Yeah. Okay, I love it. Give me a learning check. <laughs> this is where Tova says, hold my beer to Klaus. <laughs> Because I have a two in logic and nothing oh. in learning. So. <laughs> the lowest okay. roll that you can actually make. Okay. Okay. A six and a five. So one, one success. One success. Uh, it, as you were flipping through the pages of that singular book, you noticed the name Oscar Hjort in it. Huh. The list of society members... Uh, the, that that popped open mentioned his name who lived in the late 18th century he worked as a writer and spent some time in paris studying under francois dominique seraphine a famous artist who put on shadow plays for the court at versailles and the palais royal and i will share my terrible formatted note <laughs> they must be very good that's a name like that so you all have gathered some information and it's taken you most of the day to do this uh, you know that you're supposed to meet this person this Los Clint at the Witch Cat Inn and as such it is time to take the carriage you all get yourself together prepare the items that you need during your research, did any of you prepare your advantage? Now, for those that are listening at home, every player gets a single advantage per mystery, and it's left sort of open on how it works within the rules of Asin. I let my players know a little earlier uh, that I would be asking them, so they knew it was coming, though it is... Something different than what you would see in a d and or Pathfinder, or those sorts of games. What the advantage does is it will give you a plus two on a single roll during a session, as long as it can relate in some way to the roll that you're making. So I asked my players, did any of them come up with uh, an advantage that they would like to share? Well, um, uh... Of course, being a, a devout man, I uh, studied the Word of God. My Bible, my, my old Bible I keep on me. So that in the future, if anyone has lost their way, a successful uh, manipulation check might help them back on their path. Oh, I like it. So studying of the Bible. Um, and uh, I definitely could work for manipulation if you see another way that it could work i would be willing to go that direction as well anyone else uh so the doctor has been experimenting with his dosages um he self-dosing and last night he had a dream in which his um his wife appeared to him uh, along with their son a son who is never actually born, but um, she told him that she understood what he needed to do, that she was understanding and that to make sure he listened to others and, and felt what they felt so that he could convince them of what he needed much in a way that he was able to convince her. Uh, that's going to go towards manipulation. Oh, I like it. And as I told Eric, definitely towards manipulation. If you do 
at some point see it as a way to use it in another direction, I will be open to that as well. Um, Helena or Tova, do you uh, perchance have it or would you like to wait and use a uh, flashback of some sort moving forward? I think I'll wait. All right. And Tova? Um, I was thinking of maybe since I had decided to polish my gun, since learning wasn't my thing. Right. Uh, I don't know how I would word that, though. Uh, it would be like a close combat role, I suppose. It would be a close combat. So you took special care of making sure all of the gears and levers Working. within your... Mm -hmm pistol were not only working but of the utmost cleanliness and, and loaded and loaded. loaded and yeah you can de that is perfect that is okay. that is good all right i love it these advantages are kind of cool i'm i'm super excited to see how they kind of kind of play out all right so let us continue then i'm going to bring this You've made your way into the carriage. It is fall when you leave Uppsala in a coach heading south, and there is a terrible storm raging. Black clouds blanket the sky, and the wind howling, or with the wind howling and rain and hail pouring down, leaving you soaked to the skin. Lightning cracks across the sky, and thunder makes the horses rear and whinny, but the coachman drives them on with his whip. The journey takes three and a half hours, and the storm grows increasingly violent as you progress. Through the coach window, you see Lake Malar in the west, its foaming waves splashing against the shoreline. Traveling through a pine forest, you see tall trees being knocked to the ground by tempestuous winds or split by lightning strikes. In the flashes of lightning, you see large rocks among the trees, moss-covered uh, moss lumps staring back at you. Suddenly, the Witch Cat Inn appears at a T-junction, surrounded by woods, with Lake Malar to the north and west. It seems to be the only building around. The coachman is eager to drop you off and continue on his route south to Sigtuna, Halfway between the inn and the small community in the distance, you see a lovely church tower protruding from the trees. The coachman, as I said, drops you unceremoniously at the inn and is quickly off. Standing underneath the protruding roof of a stable is a man smoking. He turns and looks at you, and he nods. He motions you over. As you head to where he is, he begins to speak. Ah, I see you've made it. Good, good, good. You received my invitation? I suppose that depends on who you are, mister. Uh, forgive me, I am Olas Clint. And yeah, I reckon we got your invitation. Picked a hell of a night to take a night on the town, huh? Mm. He looks around, the rain dropping. Uh, you can see that he has already been doused with water as he moved about outside, waiting. Indeed, indeed. The invitation I sent you, it's been spread across Uppsala. Mr. Clint, perhaps we could find a place to discuss this outside, or I should say inside, where we are not being assaulted by the weather. This is highly irregular. We have two ladies here. Of course, but I want to just mention a few things before we go inside. Just so you're aware, passing travelers have alleged that there have been strange dreams at the inn. Rumor currently is that the building is in the grip of magical powers. I had heard that you all 
are as interested in matters of the occult as me. I spoke to a woman at the asylum. That may be so, but I I have found that many of these so-called demons are just those chasing the dragon and other maladies of the mind and weaknesses of the soul. He leans into you. I, too, have the power to see things that others cannot. He leans back. I visited the inn a few days ago and felt a power that frightened me. That I want your help to figure out what is going on. Indeed. Then let us get on with it. Lest one of us catches our death out here. And he looks over at Helena. Do you think I am so uh, weak of disposition that I could not handle a little rain, doctor? I would not presume to know, madam. She just kind of uh, shifts slightly and you hear that her boots squelch in the mud. Um, no, th- this is this is the least of the troubles that I have faced out there. So I think though being dry would be the preferable option here. I am not so uh, disinclined to hear him out if this is where he needs to make his uh, information known to us. Understood. Duly noted. And she sort of just kind of uh, um, shakes the, the raindrops a bit from her skirt as she turns back to the man. Though so you're interested in the occult, you say. Um, what sort of uh, strange phenomena do you seem to be facing here? You say magic, some sort of presence. Uh, do you know anything further? Uh, I'm not sure of the specifics, as I did not stay long. The, the power, or the magic... Uh, kind of washed over me. Uh, It, well, it concerned me, and I thought, well, if there are others that can help me figure it out, that would be beneficial. Um, As I said, I've spoken with people who say that you are a good group to have assist. Uh, Very well, well... To assuage the doctor's worries, perhaps we can go in where it is warmer and drier. Of course, of course. And he puts out the cigarette that he was smoking on the ground. You can see as it kind of into the mud. Puddles of water sit all around, and he walks towards the door. He opens it, and you all step inside. Tova is the last one to enter, and she's kind of mumbling to herself. Easy enough for them to say. None of them are doing their laundry later. I love it. Uh, You walk inside, and it is a right proper inn. The inside, though, feels as if it has been ravaged by something. You close the door, and the rain dissipates in the background. The layout has a bar and multiple tables. But what is more important is that sitting upon the ground in multiple areas are buckets and bowls. Water drips from the ceiling into these. The interior is warm and lively as you see there are several guests sitting at different tables. You see someone behind the bar and then a couple of people, uh, one man, one woman, who is serving and attending to those sitting at the tables. 
You, from time to time, you see uh, the man at the bar does peek his head into the kitchen and yells out orders, uh, which you would assume is for the cook to take care of. It feels weird. There is a, uh, as I said, a combination of warmth from the guests, but something feels heavier within this room. Uh, Clint walks over to a table and takes a seat. Um, Helena will take a moment. She sort of squeezes the excess water from her blouse and from her skirts um, and tries to knock some of the mud free before walking through the bar. Um, She'll uh, pull her glasses up to her face, checking the raindrops upon them and take a handkerchief free and wipe them. Um, And then she will sort of check over herself, making sure her um, satchel isn't too soaked through so that her her books and her papers are dry enough and that the uh, rag doll that she takes with her is still um, properly secured where she carries it. Um, And she follows to the table and sits down. The doctor is going to reach into his overcoat and pull out um, a handkerchief. Um, the handkerchief is actually wrapped around a um, small, small ornate box uh, that he very uh, subtly opens. He doesn't show the box to anyone. Uh, two fingers, his between his thumb and his forefinger, on the other hand, reaches into the box, pulls a little bit of something out that he very quickly brings to his nose, sniffs, and he closes the box, putting it back in his uh, his pocket, but uses the handkerchief to uh, wipe some of the excess moisture from his face before he walks over and sits down. Uh, his looking a little more aware, a little more on. Klaus shakes himself like a dog out in the rain and just rah, shakes it off, pulls the rain over, back over his hair, kind of squelches it out. Well, now that I'm soaked like a possum, let's get something to drink. Uh, and he'll walk over to the table, uh, pulling out a... Is it paper money in this time period? It feels like it should be paper money. I, <laughs> I, don't really, I pull out currency. I'm rich. I got currency. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll point to the, the bartender and go, two of whatever the best you got is, and then one for everybody else. The bartender nods at you, and uh, you see as a young lady, couldn't be more than a 16-year-old, uh, walks over. This is one of the servers walks over to the bar and uh, begins to collect the drinks for you. And Klaus will sit down at the table and will await his uh, purchase. Tova's going to stand behind the doctor um, as she usually does while he's seated and hold out her arms for his uh, soaked jacket so that she can just stand there and dry it out. The doctor, doctor uh, sensing Tova's presence, does take off his coat and hands it to her. Thank you, Tova. Most welcome, Doctor. In just a moment, the waitress comes over and uh, sets down the drinks in front of all of you. Um, Will that be all? For now, I believe. uh, Just, uh... I'll call you if I need anything. You guys good? Anybody need anything? Food, drinks, before I send her off? I don't think they're good. I don't think they're anything. All right. All right, all right, good. And she makes her way uh, back to the bar. Uh, You can see that she uh, has begun kind of cleaning up around the bar, making sure things are neat. Uh, Clint will look at the group of you. Seems weird, right? Um, All the leaking and the the darkness. There's, There's something here. I know what you mean. It feels wrong. 
But I guess the leaking could be explained away by shoddy craftsmanship. Uh, it could also be the age of the place. That tends to lend itself to leaks and things. Um, but no, it is oppressive, I think is the best word. The air feels very stagnant for a place that is so full of holes. Exactly. That's <clears throat> that's what I worry about. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, next step in the process is. Um, as I said, the the flyer that you have, did, did you all bring it with you? Oh, I knew I shoved it somewhere. Hang on. Uh, and he'll pat himself down. Oh, hang on. And he'll pull out the soaked letter and set it on the counter. Um, I don't know if there's some, uh, something about that. It, it seemed very ominous when I read it. W- what did you all make of it? I gotta be honest, I, I'm not a big fan of the shadow part of this shadow business. But, um... Uh, suppose the, the more learned ones here would have a little bit more information than I. You see as Clint looks towards the others. Tava kind of snorts at uh, Klaus saying, the more learned people. Um, I don't know why one would be afraid of one's shadow. Um, but shadow puppetry, it's... Um, it's been done for a long time. It is fascinating that this uh, inn happens to be so close to a crossroad. That can be. That can be a interesting place of energy, at least from everything that I've learned for writing my stories. Tales of things, strange things happening at crossroads. And I, <clears throat> I, maybe it's just me, but I don't see a stage nor shadow puppetry, puppetry set up in here. That should not be a surprise. There barely appears to be a roof here. This place but appears it, to be in a state of disrepair. Repair. But if we're invited to see a chateau play here, and there's no way to do a chateau play, it seems like perhaps some sort of uh, deception. And so who and why would they be trying to deceive people to come to a chateau play? Hell, I was just thinking they were going to set it up later. Should we... Or per- or perhaps they rely on those like the reverend here to buy enough drink to make people see whatever it is they wish to see. Should we should we ask someone about it? Well, yeah, I don't see why not. Perhaps the bartender or someone would know something. Well, if uh, no one else wants to take the lead on this, suppose I will. Uh, and he'll, uh, Klaus will get up and take off his overcoat, set it on the, the chair, and take one of his drinks he orders and uh, bring it over to the bar. Uh, and, and with the, the classic southern charm, he'll lean over the table and go, Excuse me, I was under the uh, distinct impression we were going to have puppetry here tonight. And, uh, now, it might just be my eyes deceiving me, but I'm not seeing such a place for that to happen. The bartender looks at you. Oh, a show? What are you talking about? He'll uh, he'll pull out a, the... Well, actually, he'll walk back over the table because he said it there. And, uh, he'll grab the, the flyer and said, Now, unless this is not, in fact, the Witch Cat Inn... I'm missing the puppets. He looks at the flyer for a moment, and you see his demeanor begins to change. 
he looks around the tavern and sees her. Sophia, we need to talk. In the back. And you see she looks at him. She sees you and sees the flyer. And you can see that a pall falls over her. She kind of lowers her head. And she walks into the back. He follows behind right after he says, Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And he goes into the back. And the next thing you hear is arguing kind of muffled what you what the hell you I told you we are never having one of these things here again uh, you hear her uh, father I'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry father I'm, it, it was it, I'm, I'm sorry father oh, oh I told you we will never be having a theater here. And the next thing you hear is you hear a smack. It is loud. Reverberates in there. You see the other guests immediately turn towards the sound. It jostles everyone awake. Immediately you see the girl run out of the kitchen and up the stairs. Klaus turns back to his friends and uh, mouths the word, oops. You see, as the bartender comes back out, oh, I apologize for that. <clears throat> there will be no show tonight. And you see the rest of the guests pretend like nothing has happened. Well, uh, Thank you for your time. And he will walk back to the group. I think I almost just punched a bartender. <clears throat> uh, did you did you get his name? No, no, I did not. Oh, I asked about the puppetry, which is obviously not happening. I was not expecting things to go quite so um, topsy turvy so quickly. He kind of peeks around and looks at him for a moment. He, um... I think he might be the owner. I'm getting that distinct impression as well. Um, Helena, you want to check up on that girl? You might be the better kind for that sort of thing. Mm, I can try and... I don't know exactly where she went, but I can follow upstairs and see. So, um, Helena will rise from the table, um, kind of straighten everything up, um, make sure her hair's kind of in order, put herself to, together as best as she can with her, her limited resources. And um, she makes her way toward the stairs where the girl disappeared. But um, she looks back toward the bar and shoots the bartender, though he's not looking her way, like toward the back of his head, a very deadly look. Her eyes are tired, but that look is sharper than anything that she's shown so far. As you take your first steps onto the stairs, they creak, and he turns, looks at you. Oh, you looking for... get a room for the night? I have my acquaintance I need to speak to. They're already staying here. I know the room number, if you'll excuse me. You're gonna need to give me a roll on that one. For that's gonna have to be manipulation. Manipulation. <laughs> manipulation. Okay, so that's empathy. Yep, because that's so act I by have line. Five dice All for right. that. Let me 
you move my other ones out of the way. So that's two sixes out of my five dice. All right. Uh, so on a success, you will get what you want. So she, uh, he does believe you. Um, let me see if there's anything with... Uh, you need, you can use them to impose a mental condition on your opponent for one, for one for each extra success. And the way it works with NPCs, NPCs are a little different. Right. Uh, when you uh, impose that mental condition, uh, they take a, a subtraction, not from a condition per se, but from their mental toughness. All right. So do you want to impose that on him? Yes. All right. So he then goes down to one mental toughness. All right. That was good. That was good. That was good. All right. So then the next question. So you go upstairs. Mm Mm-hmm. When you get up there, you look around. Sort of listening for crying, perhaps. Well, what you see is you see a variety of rooms along the southern wall. Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four, five total. Uh, on the northern wall to the east are two rooms. And on the northern wall to the west is one room. All the doors are shut, of course, as mm-hmm. this is an inn and tavern. Right. And above the hallway into the uh, ceiling, you see a trap door. Looks like maybe goes to an attic. And then, of course, the stairs back down. All right. So I'll kind of, as I pass by the doors, I'll sort of listen to see if I can hear perhaps her crying or anything that suggests which place the girl went, which room she's in. As you listen to each room, you notice there doesn't appear to be any sounds coming from the rooms. While you're listening downstairs in the dining room, uh, the four that are left, which is Klaus, Tova, the doctor, and Clint are sitting discussing what has just recently happened. And then you notice something, Dr. Klaus and Tova. You look around and you see that the other guests are starting to get sleepy. You also notice, as you look around, that Olas, Clint, starts to get sleepy. The only ones not beginning to lay their heads down are the three of you and the barkeep. Just takes moments before all of them, eyes closed, heads on tables, and the breath of the sleeping fill the room. 